you see, I spent 28 years in the music industry as an artist manager, sort of market them to record labels, get them deals and stuff like that. But what I've discovered was that the big thing with creativity is all the blocks that like in our head. So it's the procrastination, it's the perfectionism, all that kind of stuff is what blocks artists. So basically I spent 28 years just doing that, uh, working out ways to help artists start projects and then finish projects. A lot of the stuff I got from sports psychology, by the way, elite athletes have the same problem as elite creative people, right? Is it's not your talent that's in question. It's how you deal with the stress, the anxiety, the procrastination, the perfectionism, the fear of failure, all those things that can actually cripple your creative talent or your athletic talent. What's going on, people? Welcome back to another episode of the Minted Minds podcast. Um, you know, today is a, is a special one, I feel. This is one of those episodes that I've actually been looking forward to. And I'm not just saying that. The reason is... I came across, um, so with me, I have got Jake. Welcome Hi, to the everybody. podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. No, um, again, it's it's um, a pleasure having you on the podcast. And um, the reason is because when I came across your content online, it felt for me like it was the first time someone understood what was going on in my brain. Do you know what I mean? So when I came across your content, I was like, I have to get this guy on my podcast. This is something that I know I will benefit from. And also I know a lot of my audience will benefit from. So again, thank you for agreeing to jump on the podcast. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm glad the, the you know, the content has resonated with you. No, um, like I said, amazing. So I want to get stuck in. I might be a little bit selfish with this episode, but again, I think it will also help the audience. So... Just to kind of build a bit of context for the audience listening and watching. You kind of, a lot of your content is about procrastination yeah. and how, how to kind of deal with it and why we do that yeah. as well as overthinking and stuff. So before we kind of get into that, what's your background and how did you kind of come to creating this type of content in the first place? Yeah, so basically I spent 28 years in the music industry as an artist manager. Uh, so I was always managing artists, discovering artists, and developing them uh, musically. So part of the job is to do that and then to, uh, you know, sort of market them to record labels, get them deals and stuff like that. But what I've discovered was that the big thing with creativity is all the blocks that are in our head. So it's the procrastination, it's the perfectionism, all that kind of stuff is what blocks artists. So basically I spent 28 years just doing that, wow. uh, working out ways to help artists start projects and then finish projects. <clears throat> excuse me so which is the big problem so people were always coming to me and go hey jake i've got this great idea for a song i go oh, that sounds amazing and then i speak to them the next day and say how are you getting on that song oh i've moved on to another song <laughs> i say oh, okay cool what would this until they tell me about this new song oh that sounds great and then the next day it'd be another song and it just continually did this right so they'd always start and never finish projects and the reason for that was perfectionism a lot of stress and anxiety a lot of procrastination so i had to work out ways to help them get over these things so we could deliver projects to Sony or Universal or Warner's or whatever the record label was. Now, I didn't know that, uh, I'd never heard the term multipotentiality, which is what it is. Uh, I, I didn't know I was neurodivergent. I didn't know they were neurodivergent. I just thought, hey, we're creative people and we're really indecisive. And of course, that's partly true because it's our creativity that makes us so indecisive. However, I, I had to work out frameworks to help them deliver this. And that's what I did for 28 years. And then when I left the music industry, or when the music industry left me, should I say, I mean, I should say, we had a lot of success. I worked, uh, I managed artists that sold millions of albums, number one singles, number one albums, wow, okay. uh, some of the biggest DJs in the world. Can we name drop anyone? Yeah, I mean, well, Scouting for Girls was, okay. the, was the big pop band I did. Yeah. Um, and I managed them for, like, or co-managed them for eight years. And they'd been unsigned for 10 years. Um, and, you know, their, their creative confidence was just a, a complete zero. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, they, oh, yeah. I mean, it was done. They were, they were all but done. They said, okay, I'm, I've, I've, I've spent 10 years playing pubs uh, and it wasn't going anywhere. And then I just happened to hear them on XFM. Uh, and there was like this unsigned band competition. They had the song Elvis Ain't Dead, which <laughs> yeah. ended up being a top 10 hit, right? And, you know, Scaring for Girls are one of these bands. They're like a Marmite band, right? I don't, yeah. know, if, I don't know if most of your audience are in the no, UK I'd or probably, beyond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but most people hate them, right? But, <laughs> but equally, this is what you want, right? When you're creating uh, creativity, if everybody loves it, it's not going to last for long because mm. it's trendy and then it goes out of trend very, very quickly. However, we have something like a Marmite band, which is Scaring for Girls. Most people hated them, including most of the industry. Every record label turned them down, by the way. Um, 
and that's a different story maybe for yeah, a different yeah, day. Yeah. but basically everyone everyone turned them down and um uh, but a lot of people like them so the more people that hate a band the people that love them they love them, love even, them more, even more right okay. so really in the music industry what you try to do is you try to find marmite acts oh. now if if you're not in the uk that's just the, it's a okay. yeast spread but basically oh, yeah that's wicked yeah. so you know before you kind of got involved in the music industry and stuff what was your yeah. background were, what were you doing anything else or was it no i just always the music industry I, I left school at 15 um, I, I had a child psychologist. I had uh, a thing called ODD, which is oppositional defiant disorder, which is essentially ADHD. Um, and I, so I've got a very high IQ, but I just couldn't take uh, orders of anyone. Uh, mm. So I left at 15, no qualifications. So I worked in uh, yeah, hospitality for a wee while. And then I thought, well, you know, I want to be successful. How, what industry can I go in and be super successful with that I don't need any qualifications? And that was the music industry. So I said, okay, cool. And I started promoting raves um, in the north of Scotland. And I did that for about four or five years. And that was very successful. And then slowly but surely, I started managing DJs, then ended up in London. And then that's when I started getting into the whole DJ management thing. And that's when I discovered that, you know, Yes, uh, managing artists' careers and, and creativity is about creating opportunities, creating business opportunities, getting deals, making money, blah, blah, yeah. blah, all that sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. But the reason, the reason behind it, what stops people achieving that is uh, all the, you know, anxiety, perfectionism, procrastination, stress, anxiety, do indecision. You, do, you feel, do you find that a lot of successful artists, so, I, again, I don't like to use the word so far, but experience experience anxiety uh, depression Absolutely. and all these other things and yeah i think you know there's there's some you know great art comes from great pain right people say that and in my experience i'm yet to work with any artist by artist i mean some that write songs um i've worked with neurotypicals that are musicians and you know uh, they we are, every human has issues right you know just as you know you've used a few keywords there that my audience might not be aware of yeah so neurotypical so a neurotypical is uh, somebody with a, what they would call like a standard brain, okay. which means it's very convergent thinking. So it's very linear. So a neurotypical brain is just somebody that doesn't have uh, any sort of neurodivergence like ADHD or general anxiety disorder, okay. OCD, autism, etc. And then the other one was? Uh, it's neurodivergent. So, right, so right. Any, anybody that has a brain that is different, okay. essentially. And you find that a lot of the artists are neurodivergent. Every single artist. Every single every artist. Every single artist. I mean, I haven't met every single artist in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. But everyone I've worked with, with hundreds. So um, anyone that's quite creative, anyone yeah. that can sort of see things in a different way, possibly. Yeah. Do you find entrepreneurs are kind of like that, business owners and stuff? Absolutely. Entrepreneurs. Um, you know, just to be an entrepreneur, you need to be, uh, the term I use is multi-potential right? so that means you've got multiple potential and it's like a psychological term which just means that you've got uh, multiple creative and or academic talents mm. and if you think about running any business you have to wear many many hats right you have to be good at marketing branding sales uh, uh distribution etc etc that is why there's so many um entrepreneurs with neurodivergence um i mean dyslexics i think dyslexics make up of I, 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 I think it's, I, I don't, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think, I believe it's 40% of self-made millionaires in the UK, entrepreneurs are dyslexic. So well, it's, it's a Branson's crazy. Richard like the most famous one that everyone yeah, knows exactly. that's dyslexic. You know. and... but if you look at Richard Branson, you look at uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Steve Jobs, you look at anybody like that, then you will notice that there's neurodivergence on some level of the spectrum. Um, so, and it means that we're just highly creative and basically problem solvers. Okay, so with that though, saying that, as as creative as they may be, um, and I think I identify as that as well, mm -hmm. where we have so many ideas and sometimes we kind of get stuck in regards to which idea we should pursue. And then if we do pursue an idea, we might draw back and pursue another one. We don't really end up finishing an idea possibly. So is that so? Is that something that you deal with, and yeah. is that something that you have conversations with, and is that something? Is that your day to day job? Yeah, that, I, I would. I would say that's my thing. Is people get stuck, um, and um, the reason that we flip flop from one thing to another is because a we've got so many different ideas, and b we've got so many different talents. And so if someone focuses on a, a specific talent, they get FOMO about the other talents that they're not 
actually oh, utilizing, yeah, yeah. right? And it's the same with ideas. So basically, if, if we've got five different ideas, we start one, and if it's not instantly successful, we think, oh, I'm obviously yeah. doing the wrong one, and then we go to the next one and the next one, and we can end up flip-flopping from one to the other. And very quickly, what we do as humans is, is we sort of identify that as, as basically we're uh, it's people that start projects but don't finish projects. And if you start to believe that as an identity, you will find that you that becomes like a, a self-sabotaging pattern. Um, and that's basically what my artists did in the music industry. They literally came with a song, then the next song, then the next song, next song. So I had to work out ways to, I didn't know I was doing this. You know, I, did, I had no idea that, oh, you've got ADHD or, you know, uh, HSP or OCD or general anxiety, whatever the neurodivergence was. I had no idea about any of this. All I knew that we had a contract with Sony or Universal and I had to deliver a project. So we had to, we had to work out ways to be able to do that, right? So, so yeah, so that's what I now do for entrepreneurs or, you know, creators, artists, now basically do you think that um you know something that you mentioned is you didn't know it was you know adhd or etc etc yeah. do you think sometimes that's a good thing the fact that you didn't label it because then i think i don't know where i stand with this because because i've heard both arguments is some people know deep down they have maybe have adhd or dyslexia or whatever but they don't want to get it diagnosed because they will put themselves in a box and yeah. it might limit them as to what they... Because I think a lot of what we can do has to come from our belief system anyway. Absolutely. If yeah. we don't believe we can do something, yeah. we won't be able to do it. We're right either way. If you believe you can, you're right. And if yeah. you believe you can't, you're right. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So I think sometimes when we put ourselves in a box of, I don't know, I've got anxiety, so that means I can't do that. Mm. Do, you, do you think... What, what's your take on that? Well, I, I mean, again, I see both sides to this, right? So on one, on one hand, by labeling yourself, oh, I've got ADHD, means, oh, I'm not very good at doing certain things. So that's definitely a thing. The other side of it is, um, so I didn't find out I had ADHD until I was 49. Oh, really? um, and a lot of things happened in my past that I was shameful for, right? And it's that Brenny Brown thing where she says, you know, shame is I am bad and guilt is I've done something bad. Okay, and that's that's the difference, right? So basically, many times because I didn't know I had ADHD or neurodivergence, because you know I'm I'm a bit dyslexic, you know I've I've, I've got I've got quite an array uh, uh, of, of different things. But basically, because I didn't realize that, okay, um, I thought I am bad, so I, I felt a lot of shame because of things. And now when I look back at it, I uh, you know I say, oh, I just did something bad. So basically, now I I've got a lot more self compassion. So um, I mean, I screwed up uh, the other day just doing something thin and it's like I fucked it up and I was like oh now in the past I would beat myself up about that and say oh what are you doing you idiot blah 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 and now I just go ah one of those things so I feel that I've got a lot more self-compassion but I am also very aware that uh, by labeling myself as neurodivergent that I can get stuck in that kind of mindset and I have to continually question that and say you know is this really true or can I try and find a way to overcome this problem that is like self-limiting belief okay Let's 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 get down to it then. So I know a lot of people that are going to be watching this podcast are probably in a, in a in a stage in their life where they have found themselves procrastinating, mm -hmm. whether that's for an exam and they're putting it off, or whether it's starting businesses. They've got so many ideas. They know they're capable, mm -hmm. and I think I've been in a situation in my life where I know, I, and I've I've said this to someone else where I feel as if like I'm I'm a Ferrari. Mm -hmm but with a with a broken engine mm. <laughs> do you know what i mean like so the capabilities are there to kind of you know do a lot but then because you have so many ideas you just end up not doing anything at all yeah and i feel as if especially like um speaking to a few people um recently because i knew i was going to come see you um and we were going to talk about procrastination and stuff like that a lot of people are going through this at this time so in order to kind of bring a lot of value to the audience and to kind of give some practical advice to people out there, what if someone is in a position now where they are finding themselves procrastinating, overthinking, what would be like the first few steps in order to kind of either get it in, under control or to kind of cope with it? Like what would be, be your strategy? Well, I, the first thing I think I try and explain to people is that we're all stuck in a paradox. It's called the paradox of wasting our time. So the reason we don't know what to do with our lives is because we're not taking action. The reason we're not taking action is we have too many options and we're not making a decision. The reason we're not making a decision is we're scared of picking the wrong option and 
wasting our time, which means we get stuck and then we start procrastinating and then we start beating ourselves up for wasting our time. Mm. So either way, we're wasting our time. So the fear of picking the wrong thing means that we end up wasting our time. So we're scared of wasting our time. So we say, oh, I've got all these different options available to me. Oh, I don't know which one to pick because I don't want to pick the wrong one and waste my time. So we make no decision and then we end up procrastinating, which is basically procrastination and end up wasting our time. So ultimately, we're in a paradox. So if we're in a paradox of wasting our time, we might as well take action on one thing. So the most crucial part is when we're stuck, where we're, we're sitting there, when we're looking at, we've got three or four different options, is that we have to basically experiment with each option. And okay. then, so just by experimenting gives us, gives, it means that you can try out different ideas and see what works and what doesn't work. So if you've got, if you've got a business and you've got four different marketing options for you, rather than spending the next six months trying to work out which one is the best one, which you will never do because you can't think your way out of overthinking, right? We can't project the future. Yeah. What seems like a good idea in paper often ends up bad. What seems like a bad idea often ends up being good. There's no possible way of us being able to predict the future, right? All we can do is test these ideas. So you take each marketing idea, for example, you say, right, I'm gonna spend two weeks doing, a, doing each one and then seeing which one works for you and which one gives you the most traction. And then it's a process of elimination. But basically that's getting you to take action, make a decision and take action because procrastination is not making any decisions. Yeah, because I think, I think a lot of people um, are fear of taking a step because they feel as if it's a career defining decision yeah it no feels matter that how small or big it is yeah they feel as if okay if i'm if i make this decision i'm stuck with the decision so they have to make sure it's correct and yeah because it's going to dictate the rest of their life for yeah. example and it could be as simple as some like i don't know if what the name of their new business yeah it could be something as small as that um so your your say is try it out experiment yeah. it's just experiment with it i mean honestly i get people i know people that have been stuck for like months sometimes years on their websites the fonts i mean you you, you guys you guys design websites you yeah, know how yeah, people yeah, stuck, yeah, people yeah, get caught yeah. up on the, the color of the website the the font you get some people that don't care yeah and then you get some people that yeah like you said they get caught up in so the overthinkers, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what happens, basically. Uh, people just get caught up. And, you know, the, the, the key to what I do, right, is I help people make decisions. But the real thing I do is I help people be at peace with decisions they make, right? Okay. And that's, that, that, you know, that's a, like a level below that, right? So that to help people make decisions, well, just, hey, experiment, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. So that's helping people. But really what you're doing is you're helping people be at peace with the decisions they make, okay? Because really it's all, we're all stuck in our heads. Uh, so if people, for people to be at peace with the decisions they make, they know that, hey, if they pick that font, you can always change the font tomorrow if you don't like it. Mm. Or if you, if you experiment with that marketing option, okay, let's say it's, I want, I want to start up a TikTok channel. Okay, cool. Go and do 30 videos in 30 days on TikTok. And if you like it, continue. And if you don't, don't. Move, you know, take the skills you've learned. You've obviously learned some skills about creating content, about you know, uh, overcoming the fear of being seen and procrastination, whatever. And then put that into a podcast or a newsletter or whatever. The point is just to experiment. But really what we have to realize is nearly every decision we make is reversible. Okay, okay. What I recommend for clients to do is that when we do experiments, okay, it helps us remove our identity from things, okay? The reason people don't want to do things, right? Perfectionism and, you know, the stress and anxiety comes from fear of failure or whatever, right? But when we do an experiment, we can remove our identity from the success uh, or failure of the outcomes, right? Because basically some experiments work and some experiments don't. Mm -hmm. So basically it's the experiment that succeeds and fails and not us. And that's a crucial, crucial point, right? Because it helps us just get into an experimental mindset as opposed to, oh, I've got to make this work. Otherwise I'm going to feel like a failure or gonna, I'm gonna look bad or whatever. And that's what happens to people, right? And then they put too much pressure into making it the best podcast in the world or the best TikTok in the world and they overthink it. So really what we have to do is experiments where we remove our identity from the outcomes so some experiments work some experiments don't that's what experiments do and it's a really critical but simple mindset shift so so just to kind of give a bit of context so for me for example the podcast my experiment would be okay i'm going to post a podcast episode every single week for the next three months correct that that's uh, an example of experiment absolutely now whether they do well or or bad it's the experiment that's 
done good or bad, not me. Absolutely. Is, and is, Yeah, is, and I, let, let, let's say you want to do, I think you talked about doing some sort of like TikTok lives, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that would have been, from the first time you did it, that would have been an experiment, right? Mm. So, you know, you, you did a TikTok live and it went well. So the experiment went well, okay? Mm. But let's say, that, so let's say you went on TikTok live and it didn't go well, then the experiment didn't go well and you don't have to do the experiment again. Mm. So really, it's, it's removing your identity from the outcomes of these experiments and creative projects. How do you know if you've experimented, experimented long enough for it to get true results? I think you know. I mean, with TikTok, <laughs> for example, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, I started to enjoy it because I was facing my fear. I, I, you know, I was getting dopamine from facing the challenge. Each time, every day I had to put out a video, <laughs> I was shitting myself, right? But So I, my automatic reaction was to procrastinate and run away from that fear, right? However, I didn't. I overcame that. And that gave me more dopamine. So the, I think, yeah, the, I think the reality is that we know. The important thing about experiments, and this is really important as well, is that if we say, hey, I'm going to post a video a day for 30 days, that we do that, we finish it. Because what we're doing then is we're reframing our identity as someone that starts and finishes projects. Mm -hmm. So the only thing we have to do to succeed in our experiments is if we say we're going to do something for seven days on the bounce, we do it for seven days on the bounce, right? And then we can walk away and say, hey, I succeeded because I did whatever the thing was for seven days on the bounce. And that's quite interesting, actually, because I know I've come across people where they said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then you speak to them like a couple of months later, I haven't tried it. I yeah. didn't even attempt to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. And that's because of the fear. They said, well, if I, if I do this and then it's going to feel cringe and what happens if I fail? Yeah. And basically we start thinking of all the negatives, right? But that's the whole point of experiments. Mm. Most experiments don't work, right? Mm. So it's really, it's a really important sort of mindset shift. All these things are just very, very delicate mindset shifts. A lot of the stuff I got from sports psychology, by the way, um, because, you know, elite athletes have the same problem as elite creative people, right? Is it's not your talent that's in question. It's how you deal with the stress, the anxiety, the procrastination, the perfectionism, the fear of failure, all those things that can actually cripple your creative talent or your athletic talent. So a lot of the stuff I do is actually come from uh, sports psychology methodologies. So really, it's not, it's, it, you know, in our heads, we go, hey, the, the you know, uh, the, the, my whole business career is based on this one decision. But that's just, just in our heads, overthinking it. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, now that you've said that, I think looking back at my sort of experience, especially as I've been growing the podcast, you know, the, you know like, like we know, there's, there's been episodes that do really well. There's some episodes that haven't done as great as I thought they would be. And I feel as if like at the end of an, uh, an episode that's done really well, for example, I feel this added pressure where the next episode has to be just as good, if not better. So it kind of, I find myself sometimes kind of not taking action. And is that because I'm probably scared of not meeting my goal? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of loss aversion bias. So uh, there's in, in the music industry, most people know about this, one hit wonder syndrome. Yeah. And what happens is that in an artist in the beginning, they create music for themselves, okay? Mm. Um, and then over a period of time, they have basically, let's say they got onto Radio 1, it's getting played 25 times a week. It's on all the top uh, playlists on, on Spotify and so on. So all, they've gone from no audience to all of a sudden have a big audience. So it's a bit like having a, you know, a, a podcast episode that does it it exceptionally up. well. Yeah. Blows up, right? So you think, oh my God, uh, then you have a loss of version bias, right? So you've gone from like no audience to suddenly having a big audience, right? Uh, you don't want to lose that audience. So what the artists start doing is they stop creating music for themselves, right? And they start trying to second guess what the audience audience wants but see you know some people in the audience they want black everyone want pink everyone want green everyone want blue so you start second guessing and when you try to please everyone you end up pleasing no one so in other words you overthink the shit out of it and you always screw it up when we're trying to create something great by second guessing what the audience wants is is a, just a nightmare for uh, uh, overthinkers because basically it just creates all these different decisions that we have to make whereas if you create uh, a podcast episode after you're in that situation let's say you have another one a big spike and you go okay so if you create a podcast episode that you love for yourself you say this is the best podcast episode i could possibly do i love it right then what you try to do is you try to find people that agree with you in that as opposed to second guessing what the audience wants it's 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 uh i mean david boyd did this rick rubin talks about this the audience comes last for for any of your uh viewers uh, or listeners uh, that have uh, uh, read Rick Boomer's book, he talks about the audience comes last. But this is not a, a, a creative philosophy that, that's, be, that's been about decades before 
Rick Rubin was about, David Bowie, Bob Dylan, the, the Beatles, Kanye, you know, they create work that they think is great and then they find people that agree with them as opposed to trying to please with the audience. And that's, that's where we get stuck in. Yeah, and I, I, and I have seen it as well and I have heard people talk about it, especially content creators um, on certain platforms where they feel as if, because, I, is it, am I right in saying they kind of get used to that dopamine hit that they get sure. when it's kind of, for example, if they if they get a certain amount of views, it kind of gives you this dopamine hit that you kind of get addicted to. So yeah. then when you don't get it, you kind of get frustrated yeah. and you kind of get annoyed with yourself. And then what, does that put you back in the procrastination stage, I suppose? Well, it, it's just, it's trying to chase views. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Um, and basically, if you're putting your whole creative self-worth into the views, uh, likes, shares, you're essentially giving over control, mm. okay, of your of your creative self-worth to other people. And it's essentially, if you think about it, it's like, it's like people pleasing with your creativity. And the problem with that is it creates uncertainty. Now, uncertainty creates stress and anxiety. And basically, procrastination is just our emotional management system avoiding stress and anxiety. So if you don't feel like you're in control of a situation, which you never are, if you're creating for the audience, if you're creating for algorithms and stuff like that, uh, likes and so on, then you're always going to be a state of stress and anxiety, which means you're going to procrastinate more. If you create stuff for yourself, okay, and you go, hey, this is creatively authentic. I love this podcast episode. Even if nobody else likes it, I'm proud of it, right? Then you feel good about yourself and you you feel less stress and anxiety because you're in control of how you feel about your own work, but you can't control how the audience or the algorithm feels about your work, which creates the stress and anxiety, which means you procrastinate more. I like that. I feel as if that's what I'm probably doing with this episode mm. because... What, this episode right now? With, with literally what we're recording now, I feel as if I'm doing this for me. Yeah. And I feel as if... if I'm going to get any value out of it. I know my audience will, even if it's a small amount of Absolutely. people. And it will also attract people that may be interested in this sort of topic of procrastination and and um, overthinking. And I, and I think it's because this small audience that might find it beneficial is growing, especially in the world that we're living in today with social media. Sure. We want everything instant. Um, you know, likes, we all get this dopamine hit that we're so addicted to. Um, I, I think there's other reasons, I don't know how it links in with this, of people not wanting to start businesses and stuff is because there's a fear of judgment mm -hmm. or um, they're, they're afraid of what other people might say, even they're as close as their friends and family might um, have like an opinion on them. Sure. Like even for me, like I've never been one to kind of put myself out there so you know if I reflect back and I look back I've always been an introvert at times and an extrovert at other times it's, it's kind of I, can't, I wouldn't be able to box myself in one mm. but when it comes to business I've always liked my work to do the noise and 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 speak for itself whereas when you're coming into but I've always liked the concept of creating content. Like if I look years back, I knew creating content was something that you have to do in order to kind of build a personal brand and to kind of build leverage. So when mm. you do start a business, you've already got an audience that you can sell to. So I've always had this idea, but you know, the, the concept of having cameras like we have now and speaking to the cameras and having this, it's so unnatural to me. Mm. And I don't know whether that's come from, I don't know, what, fear of judgment? Would, would, what would you think? What would you take? Yeah, I think, I think it's a fear of judgment. I think it's a fear of being seen. I mean, I, I suffered from it as well. Uh, I never, before TikTok, I'd never had any social media at all. Oh, really? Yeah, this, that, that's my first one. on TikTok. I'm very active on TikTok. I really enjoy it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's good fun. Um, I can get caught up in the bullshit as well sometimes. Mm. And I have to sort of take a step back. And, you know, I do have a bit of a love-hate with it. Sometimes I just go through a period where I just want to, I just need to stop and, and, and I do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically that was my whole challenge really was that, yeah, I said, uh, you know, we talked about doing experiments before. I was stuck. I think, oh, I need to move my business forward. Uh, uh, I'd left the music industry or the music industry had left me and I had to fi find out ways to, you know, of what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, my whole identity was wrapped up in uh, being an artist manager. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the hell am I going to do now? So I, I had to take uh, risks and I had to, take, you know, I had all these options in front of me. So one of them was start a TikTok channel. Pe I already I had a newsletter. People kept coming to me and saying, you know, a newsletter about creativity and all the things I talk about now. Um, 
Um, and people say, hey, you should go on TikTok. We're really good. But I was too scared. So I said, oh, no, I'm what too you, busy. What were you scared of? Uh, putting myself out there. Uh, you know, the, the criticism, you know, maybe my ideas aren't good enough. You know, I'd, I'd gone through uh, a massive burnout. I uh, lost my identity it, it, it completely because, you know, I spent 28 years just doing this thing. Like, you know, I'm Jake, I'm arts manager, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm just Jake. And then it's like, oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, so there was a lot of self-doubt there, a lot of anxiety. Uh, but anyway, I, I said, look, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to do 30 videos in 30 days. And if I don't like it, then I can just walk away. So that, that was a way of me getting out of procrastination so was that kind of you taking your own advice like that yeah point? yeah that, that that's basically it so and i did 30 videos in 30 days and i enjoyed it and the first the first i mean most people that build a um not that i've got a huge audience but i've got a fairly significant audience uh on on tiktok but basically most people in my situation go back and delete their early videos hmm. thus giving the impression that we've always <laughs> been very comfortable <laughs> on camera that's not the case i've left them there because uh, you know, to show the journey. Yeah, A, to show my journey, but to show my, I've got a bunch of other clients. I work with a bunch of people, like MBAs and PhDs. I work with artists. I work with all kinds of different people who are wanting to build audiences. So I, I that way they can see that I was uncomfortable once because they only see me now, which is, and I'm, I'm really comfortable on camera now. It doesn't bother me, right? Um, so anyway, so, uh, but yeah, I did 30 videos in 30 days. And by the time I got to maybe the third week after day 21, 22, um, I felt quite comfortable. So um, anyway, on day 31, I had my first viral video. So if I if I'd stopped at day, day what, sorry day thirty one oh so really yeah, yeah really and then again nobody believes me you can go back and people can <laughs> uh, can go to my account uh, and they can count it because that's what my clients do but basically yeah so if I'd stopped in day number thirty we wouldn't be having this conversation right and all this came my whole business as a creator um, in the last three years has come from um, basically experimenting taking risks. Um, and getting out of these, getting out of being stuck in these procrastination loops by just experimenting, um, just tiny little experiments and trying all these little creative projects. And it's, uh, yeah, completely, it's a, it's a game changer. That's crazy to think if you stopped on day 30. Yeah. You wouldn't be here. Yeah. So after you creating your first video. Well, I would be here. This is my house. But, yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be here. But you wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, so, okay, so... Because uh, what you just said, I feel as if a lot of athletes feel that. So when they come to like, when it comes to them retiring, mm -hmm. they fall into depression. Because oh, absolutely. They've always identified as Super being common. a boxer. I've, I've got clients in that situation. Yeah. Uh, uh, for, former, uh, former athletes. And it makes sense because yeah. it's like, the, it's all they've ever known at absolutely. that point. It's and your they've identity. always had that clear goal. I want to be the best. I yeah. need to train hard and that's it. Yeah. I've got someone else looking after my diet. I'm just eating. And then once they retire, it's like, okay, what next? Yeah. And then they fall into that kind of depression. So that that was quite interesting. So you kind of looked back and kind of took your own advice in regards to experiment, try yeah. this, try that. So what was it like then after, you, for example, your first video? Because I feel as if, like podcasting, for example, I, I've read a statistic. Don't quote me on it. It's something along the lines of only 1% get past episode number 25 or yeah something, something like, like that, that. Yeah, and yeah. then so if you think about it people give up pretty quick they do because that. they don't see the results that they're in their head probably have imagined mm. now lucky for me and it's i don't know if it's I, I got quite lucky because my first episode and i think it kind of if i didn't have the awareness that i do have now that could have set me up to fail if anything mm. because my first episode done quite well relative to kind of having a brand new channel yeah i've not had any audience before this podcast so this was kind of my first step into kind of content creating and i had um he's like one of my good friends from that i've known since i was a young kid now he does copying uh, i don't know if you know about copying yeah no I have, yeah I've heard he's it, yeah. done it um his clients involve anthony joshua and you know these ksi and ah, all right, these big wow. athletes and um so i thought perfect you know that's mm. a perfect first guest he was more than up for coming onto the podcast and um and he kind of especially within the birmingham area anyway it kind of, and, and our south asian community it kind of blew up yeah now i remember then my next episode it was with another guy that I respect, um, who's got a lot of wisdom, who's a lot older than, well, not, I would say a lot older, but he's a lot older than my audience at the time. And I remember um, publishing it and, it and it wasn't doing the numbers as the first one. So it was kind of like, but I knew I just have to keep it up. I knew yeah. that even, even till this day, I feel as if up until like my hundredth video, I'm not, I don't want to 
really focus on my numbers mm. and the views because I know I'm just going to set myself up to fail again. Mm. I'm always going to be refreshing and just having a look at, which sometimes I do catch myself doing sometimes. But I just want to know in your experience, that first video that you posted up on TikTok, what, what kept you going and uh, allowed you to upload that second, third, fourth? Yeah. Because I know a lot of people at that time will think, oh, it's not working out. Well, I mean, uh, people are welcome to go and check them out. They're, I hate them. They're absolutely cringe. <laughs> I fucking hate them. Uh, even to this day, I just cringe when I watch it. I'm yeah. just so awkward. I, I mean, a lot of people look at it and go, oh, you're not that bad. Honestly, I, I just know what's going through my head, right? Um, but the, basically, I reframed it. I said, okay, look, I'm going to do this challenge. I want to overcome my perfectionism. I want to overcome my fear of being seen because it's obviously holding me back. And it's what, hold, it's what holds every creative person back is that fear of judgment, criticism. So I said, okay, um, the my purpose for this is to a uh, it c can this turn into like some sort of business or something like that be great but my main goal was to just to uh, overcome my fear of putting content out so 30 videos in 30 days um so even though that they're really cringe i look at them with a sense of pride and that's what i did at the time i had to reframe i went oh that's really cringe but then i reframed i said okay listen you you should be proud of yourself for posting something that you know is cringe Right. Mm. So I, so what I did is I turned to, I, I, I chose to reframe it and look at the courage it took me to keep posting cringe content, which is what I did until I went viral. And, um, I mean, some, you know, listen, uh, I, I've got, I've, I've had about 18, I've been lucky enough to have about 18 viral videos now, which is about 6%. So about one out, one out of every 13 videos I post, uh, statistically goes, uh, goes viral. Right. Um, but I don't think of it like that. I just think of it as like creating content and putting stuff out there. But yeah, I mean, it was really difficult in the beginning, but what, one of the main things I help clients do is, is build personal brands. And the first thing you can, you can, you can have all the knowledge, you can buy all the courses, you can do whatever you want, right. And know exactly exactly how to create the best content in the world until you overcome that fear of actually being seen um then it's it's all futile it's a bit like being an athlete um you know you can you can be the fastest person in the world but if you can't overcome the perfectionism the comparison uh, and the procrastination to train it's never going to happen for you you know do you have any practical steps that my audience probably could take in order for them to kind of get over that initial um because i don't know if you've come across a guy called ali abdel Yes, of course, yes. Um, and he speaks a little bit about this. And one of the things that I took from him was, because uh, I found myself, again, in that position where, you know, scared of judgment and whatever it is. No matter how big or strong we are, we always naturally, you know, I I've had people with me that are probably like, you know, world-class boxers and stuff. Mm. But as soon as the camera comes on, it's kind of like... Kind yeah, of like yeah, yeah. So, you know, this whole scared of ju um, being judged is is common with a lot of people so he said record an episode yeah without the intention of uploading it yeah and then what you'll find you look back and be like you know what just put it up yeah i don't know if that if that's something that yeah you no do. i did um um one of the things the weird things about being for anyone that's ever done a tiktok you'll understand it's like a talking head one is that you have to obviously it's seeing your face in the camera <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's reversed i didn't know i've got i've got an elvis uh, lip curl i'd never do that i never do that right so oh i've got one of them and it's on the wrong side of my face and it's like it's a really weird experience so first i would say pr uh, practice just doing some videos not for, for for posting if you want to post them post them right but that's what i did that first and i got used to that the other thing is just your privacy settings on TikTok. I don't know if this, if you get this on other platforms, but if you go into your privacy settings, you can actually stop anyone that um, that's in your contacts seeing your content, and that's a huge thing. Oh, well, can you? Yeah. So just go into uh, basically a, a quick uh, TikTok <laughs> tutorial here. Go into your privacy settings, and then um, just go into privacy, and then basically, you know, who, who sees your content? Flip that there, and basically you just switch it all off. So anybody that's in your your contacts and your phone, Facebook friends, anything like that, switch them all off and nobody that you know will see your content. And that's a massive thing because most of the th most of my clients are worried about their sister or their colleagues or their friends. It's not so much their enemies that they're worried about, right? It's, it's people that they actually know and like and respect. Yeah, that is quite true actually. And, um, but at the same time, I feel like there's another thing that's called the spotlight effect. I don't yeah. know if you've also yeah, come yeah. across it, that we all go around exactly, yeah. thinking that there's a massive spotlight on us yeah. and our life and everyone is looking at every little move that you do and anything embarrassing that you do, the whole world's going to be laughing at you and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. When in reality, everyone's too busy thinking about themselves and yeah. they're not as focused as you think they are. And even if you did do something stupid or silly on the internet, 
um, people forget about it two yeah. months later. And I think that helped me as well align to think, because there's a lot of my friends that have started posting content online. So why do I think that people might look at me in in a weird way, think, oh, look at him, he thinks he's someone or... And even if they do feel like that, eventually they won't because as long as you stick to it. Like now, if people have come up to me and say, oh, you know what, you, you know, you've done well in your podcast and it's, you're smashing it, you're killing it. Um, whereas maybe at the beginning, I probably would have thought, oh, maybe who am I to have people on my podcast? Who am I to talk about business and stuff like that? So that's a quite a, an interesting thing where... People don't care as much as you think they do. No, it's absolutely true. Um, and of course, this, I mean, this is so common. Every single client, you know, experiences imposter syndrome. Yeah. And even now, I still feel it. And you know, honestly, I think it, it, in small doses, it's uh, uh, as, as long as you, if, as, you, as long as you feel the imposter syndrome and you, you take action anyway, then I think it's a healthy thing because it means you're out of your comfort zone. You're continually pushing, you know, mm. uh, yourself uh, in growth, business, personal, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, people get people get 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 get, get caught up and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is, it's it's basically we have to we have to be concerned about two different things, right? One, we are we're either concerned how other people perceive us, which is people pleasing. Now, whether we're doing that for creativity, you know, please like my work, please please yeah. please externally validate my work, so I think that I'm good enough. Or we please we please ourselves, uh, you know. So we are it's it's about how we perceive ourselves. So it's about creative authenticity, or it's about creative people pleasing. So my my content, which massively saves me from all these things, is I just go, okay, what is what is the problems I want to solve? What is the 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 the, the authenticity that I want to bring to this creativity? Um, and then I stop worrying about what the audience thinks. Because it doesn't matter what they think. I can't control what they think, right? Mm. Uh, and again, you know, the, the, this is a very sort of common uh, creative philosophy. It's disengaging yourself from what other people think of your work. It's just that I, I like my work. And the thing is that when I'm creating, right, I'm creating, I'm solving my own problems. So if I feel perfectionistic, I'll create content about perfectionism. If I feel I'm being unproductive, I might write an article about being more productive. All the time I'm trying to solve my problems. So I'm very connected to it. So it's very authentic, right? And but I do this knowing that my audience, that my clients also have the same problems as me. Hmm. Another example in the music industry is that when you have writer's block, write about your writer's block. Okay. Hmm. So that Natasha Bedingfield song uh, called Unwritten was basically about writing about her uh, writer's block. And then they changed it into a metaphor about a relationship, right? Uh, Gwen Stefani on her first uh, solo album, uh, you know, the song TikTok, TikTok, what yeah. you doing, what you doing now, right? That's all about her writer's block. Because when an artist leaves a very successful group, like No Doubt, then all of a sudden all the pressure's on them. Uh, they get in their heads, they overthink it, and then they have writer's block. So whatever you're feeling, whatever emotion you're feeling, right, I create content about it, which means it's about me, right, which is very selfish. And David Bowie said the same. He said, I, I, he said I'm very selfish. I only create and perform for myself because I can't possibly second guess what the audience wants. So really, creativity is about um, uh, self-expression. It's about processing our emotions. And if we think of it in those terms, we stop worrying. We still worry a bit. Because yeah, we're yeah, human, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But we stop massively worrying about what the audience or the algorithm thinks. Because some some of my favorite videos are the ones that have done that, that, ha that haven't got a lot of views. But for me, it was like processing some sort of emotion that previously I would sweep under the carpet, right? Mm. And of course, that would overspill and you know burn out and frustration, anger, whatever, right? Um, so yeah, so creativity is is a way of being able to process emotions and uh, creatively express ourselves authentically. So do you think we have to kind of look at our goals and and assess whether it's the right goals or not for example okay so i've got this podcast my goal might be i want to build the best podcast with the most amount of views and x amount of time is that a healthy goal to have possibly not because because then you're tying yourself to the number of views another way to reframe that would say i want to have a podcast that massively impacts thousands tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people now it's kind of the same goal but basically what you're doing is you're focusing on the the audience in terms of having an impact and having a purpose and a meaning as opposed to um numbers and views which are just uh i mean they're they're i mean you know it's vanity cliche metrics. it's vanity yeah. metrics right yeah. um if we base our creative self-worth on vanity metrics it's actually um i don't know yeah I'll be honest, it's, it's hard not to. It's it's really difficult not to. Because, you know, I know there's going to be people thinking, you know, it's easy to say that because, you know, we get this, again, it's that dopamine hit that we get when we see the views and the likes. 
so it just makes us want to feel that again and again and yeah. again and it makes us feel as if okay people actually care what i do people actually like what i'm putting out even though you might not like it yourself and you're yeah. only doing it because you know it's going to get likes and shares and let's be quite frank you know there's probably girls that show certain parts of their body and they know they're going to get likes yeah. but and guys <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and guys, yeah. <laughs> and it's like but the value is not there not in my opinion whereas I'd respect someone more if they actually provide real value. So it's like me getting someone on the podcast who I believe is not doing something morally or ethically right. Yeah. But I know it's going to get views mm -hmm. or trying to ex I don't know how to put it. basically doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I I'd feel that and I wouldn't be happy with it, even though my views are... Yeah, because it'd be in, inauthentic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, that, that a major driver for us is authenticity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, for example, like when I first started, before TikTok, I started a newsletter. Um, and I'd know I, I was just completely burnt out. Uh, you know, I'd lost my identity from the music industry, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, so I was really lost, really lost and aimless. And I thought the only way I started journaling um, and then I thought I really need to get this out into the world. So for the first eight months, it was a sub stack. I had like 200 uh, followers and maybe only like now I've got quite a high open rate over 40, 45 percent. But back then I had maybe like 25 percent people opened. Oh, so yeah. so so really I was just writing an article, which and I'm dyslexic as well. So and I'd never written before anything because um, I left school at 15. So I really struggled with writing. It would take me maybe 30 hours to write one of these articles, okay? And I put it out and maybe like 50 people read it. I'd, get, I'd be lucky if I got one like. And I did this for eight months, right? And then I started getting better at writing and I started getting, I started um, sharing them on Reddit. They started going viral and blah, blah, I started to build an audience. So it's, so for me, it's a really important thing to be creatively authentic. Now, did it piss me off that I only got one like after spending something for 30 hours? Absolutely. But equally, did it help me process my emotions? Did it help me process my burnout, my depression? Did it help me discover, rediscover and reinvent who I am as a person, as an identity? Absolutely. fucking -lutely. It's the most important thing I've ever, ever, ever done and will ever do. And don't get me wrong, I get caught up in all the bullshit too, right? I go, oh yeah, there we go. And, you know, but equally, each time I do that, something inside me, you know, it feels inauthentic, right? And as a result of that, I can temper myself and I create, you know, I create uh, content to solve my own problems, right? And I've got plenty of problems because I'm human and I'm neurodivergent and I'm a multipotentialite. So I'm constantly overthinking things. I'm constantly got emotional uh, situations, right? We're, we quite famously have uh, emotional regulation problems. So we feel things much higher, right? It's, it's a hypersensitivity. It's what makes an, an artist or a creative person creative is that we feel things, you know, joy, love, happiness and a higher frequency. But equally, we feel the the procrastination, the depths, the, the sadness much, much deeper than a neurotypical person would. So creativity for me is a way of being able to process my emotions. Doesn't mean to say I don't get caught up in the bullshit thinking from time to time. I absolutely do. However, I, I absolutely do. Uh, I consciously minimize that because creativity for me is about solving my own problems and then helping. If I can help other people feel seen and heard my content, right, then that makes me feel seen and heard in my content. And ultimately, that's what we want as humans. You know, creativity is there to connect with people. So, yeah. The few things I want to talk, uh, just uh, elaborate on. One is... <clears throat> The fact that you said, you know, you started writing even though you knew that you weren't that much of a good writer. Yeah. And um, that's quite interesting because I'm thinking about starting to blog more. Yeah. Um, one, because like you've said, it kind of helps you to kind of clear out your head or... To yeah, you of, can articulate your thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Articulate your thinking and it kind of makes you understand what you're thinking Absolutely. a little bit better. So I'm starting... Um, so what I'm doing is... Um, taking my web design business a little bit more serious now. So with that, I've decided that I'm going to create a web design blog. Mm. So as I'm learning, I'm going to be teaching and I find that um, as I'm going to be doing that, it will help me to obviously understand what I'm teaching. Absolutely. To a point where I can actually teach it. Um, but okay, so I want to discuss that. But before that, um, you said... Um, so okay, so when you started to blog... What kept you going again? 
because you know you said that um there was times where you fell into depression and stuff like that and i know a lot of people that are watching are going to be in that similar situation sure sure you know it's easy to say yeah just get up and write 30 blogs but there's got to be something that kind of kept you going or was it like a promise to yourself that i know if i do i just i had to do it i i thought i was going crazy i really did um and yeah i was just completely lost and i thought the only way out of this is to write about how i'm feeling so i was writing about burnout i was writing about depression i was writing about creativity i was writing about identity i was writing because i was like who the fuck am i now? <laughs> yeah. you know, i mean it was really i mean it sounds, sounds deep, weird yeah. and deep but it, it's true um and, you know, it, it's not uncommon. I mean, I'm Gen X. I'm like 52, uh, 53 this year. So it's not uncommon that people go through what they call a midlife uh, crisis anyway, right? But in a philosophical term, it's like nihilism. It's kind of realizing, in my particular case, I'd spent all my life going, hey, I'll, I'll be happy when I manage, you know, some of the biggest DJs in the world. Well, I did that. I had all these hits, traveled the world, and that never made me happy. And okay, I'll be happy when I manage a pop band uh, that sells millions of albums. Oh, that never made me happy either. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So you eventually come to this realization that, uh, all the all the success uh, doesn't fill the voids inside of us, right? Um, so that uh, that all happened like over a period of decades, right? And by the way, if, if uh, Jim Carrey's got this, there's some brilliant Jim Carrey's brilliant at this kind of stuff. He's got ADHD and obviously one of the most successful yeah, actors maybe. of our generation. Yeah, he's maybe. brilliant, I love him. Yeah. And he's got this brilliant thing that's on TikTok, and he's he's doing an acceptance suite, uh, speech at the Golden Globes. And I think this kind of sums up the whole success will make me happy thing. He goes, uh, yeah, "I'm Jim Carrey, two times winner of Golden Globe awards. Now, when I go to sleep at night, I don't go to sleep uh, at night as a go, uh, Jim Carrey, two times." Golden Globes winner I go dreaming three times Golden Globes award winner and at that point that's when I know I'll be worthy right and it's the whole point is that you know we, we try and have all the, the success and to fill the voids to make ourselves feel better so anyway it, it was all on this journey and it came to the, uh, a very abrupt end and it all went uh, uh, the shit hit the fan um, so yeah I was completely lost and I just had to get this emotions out of me and I've never been creative I've always hidden I've been um, if anyone's ever read The Artist's Way they talk about shadow artists and I your classic shadow arts i was hiding behind other creative people and sort of pushing them out you know to helping them be more creative be more successful but i wasn't using my creativity my innate creativity so so i just had to do it um so that's what i mean i i know for a fact that i can create not for an audience because i was getting one like every week for eight months you know i mean maybe sometimes i got two likes i was like hey you got two likes this week but yeah so so i I think that's what it is about creativity um and as a result off the way i've come into it then you know i very much hold on to that because that's what keeps me it's very difficult to be a content creator for the very reasons you're talking about is that we attach our self-worth our creative self-worth to numbers vanity metrics and it's very difficult because that's up and down and it creates there's so much stress and anxiety because you know you're you're trying to oh I, people please i hope the audience like my work enough to validate my creativity i feel as if I, like, as a content creator i feel like the way the analogy i use is kind of like you're on stage mm. you've you've put yourself on stage yeah now you feel as if you always have to beat your previous performance yeah. again and again and again and again and it gets exhausting it does and and like you said when you especially when you're living for those vanity metrics even though you don't probably necessarily believe in that content at that time slowly you are going to lose yourself i think mm. because now you're just living for your audience rather than producing content that you're absolutely happy. okay so it's interesting that you said that so when was the last time this is a bit of a deep question that's fine when was the last time you were happy i'm happy now i mean yeah i mean i'm in a really place where uh, i feel very very fortunate uh, I mean, you know, my family, I've, I've, had to, I've had to change my core values and priorities uh, in the past. And, and this is very sort of classic of any sort of workaholic. I didn't realize I was a workaholic uh, up until uh, I think my daughter, my, my daughter, uh, we've only got one kid and she's the, the light of my life. She was about three or four and I was spending time with her and she said, Daddy, why don't you like spending time with me? And I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? I love you. You are the most important thing in my life. All this work, and in my head, this is work all this, you see, in my head, all this work I was doing in the music industry, right, was I was doing it to provide the holidays and the cars and all the material things, right? So what it was that my daughter was saying, because I obviously spent a lot of time with my daughter, is that I was there in body, but I was always thinking about something else. I was thinking about, all oh, uh, ticket sales or this sponsorship or this record deal. And that's what I was like in the music industry. I was a complete workaholic. 
Um, and at that moment there, that realization, I went, bloody hell, right? And at that point there, I said, right, I'm out of the music industry and I have to change my life and put my family first. And that's what I do. And that's my core values. So, so now, previously, my sense of self-worth was about how successful can I be, right? And now it's about how much of a good dad I can be. And I can control being a good dad, whereas I can't control how much success I can have, right? Because that's down to algorithms and, you know, outside factors. So just just resetting my self-worth about how good a dad and a partner I can be, right? Uh, and so that's part one. Part two is that how many... Off, I've got a lot of experience, largely because I spent most of my life really fucked up, right? But as a result of that, I've been able to sort of work out a lot of frameworks. Um, all the artists I work with in the music industry had very, very similar problems. I had to work out frameworks to get them to get shit done. You, you know, you don't, go, you don't take someone from a completely unknown to one of the biggest DJs in the world in three years without going through a lot of emotional, mm. strategic and framework uh, work to help people, you know, to excel that level of creativity. And the same with Scouting for Girls. So, so basically, I've got a lot of knowledge. Um, and as a result of that, uh, I can create content that solves my own problems, my perfectionism, because I'm still fucked up. We're all fucked up. But basically, uh, uh, I, I can do that now and I can put out content that helps other people feel seen and heard. That makes me feel seen and heard. So as a result, I'm happy now. I can only imagine what you must have felt like when your daughter said that. Because I think Crushing. Changed my life. But I'm so glad she did it. And she's so insightful, you know. Uh, and just at that moment there, you know, uh, and of course, we, that's never happened since because, you know, that was it. And I wasn't even aware I was doing it in my warped mind and any workaholic. Because the thing is, is that uh, uh, multipotentialites, we're, we're, we're our, our self-esteem is based on our productivity. If we're not being productive all the time, we think even even if I'm watching Netflix, right, on a Friday night, I'm low key scrolling my phone, something work related. Your audience who are multipotentialites will resonate with this, right? So our whole thing is about based on productivity. So I thought I was being a great dad by being productive all the time and da 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 out making money or whatever, right? And really, all my daughter wanted was to spend some time with me. That was it. And it's at that realization there, I'm thinking, oh my God, my priorities are all screwed up. But that was that I came crashing down at that point, my whole identity, everything. But at the same time, it, it was the best thing that happened to me. It had to happen. Otherwise, I'd probably still be living that way now, right? Hmm. So now I feel like I've got a lot of purpose and meaning in my life because my family comes first. What I do is I help people um, who've got the same brains as me. All my content on TikTok is basically content with my own problems. Uh, every article, I've got hundreds of articles on Substack, right? Uh, I've written hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words, right? And this is all me articulating my thoughts and working out my own problems, knowing that it's helping out the younger version of me some of my clients are in their 70s, but, you know, metaphorically speaking. And that, that feels really purposeful, you know. You don't get that in the music industry. Would you say you're more fulfilled now than when you were in the music industry? Way more. Absolutely. I mean, by the way, not that I regret the music industry. I made a lot of money in the music industry. I had a lot of experience. I toured around the world. I had so many different experiences. I, was, I wasn't like the most successful arts manager ever, but, you know, I had a really, really successful career, right? Um, so I have no regrets about doing it whatsoever. Um, but, yeah, way more fulfilled now. Would, it, would, it, would there be anything that you would have changed now, knowing what you know now and, and everything like that? Would there have been any changes that you would have Yeah, made? I just wouldn't have put myself... I wouldn't have gone, I'll be happy when dot, 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 right? It's a big mistake everyone makes, right? Uh, I mean, it's your classic sort of midlife crisis thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, working, your, working for decades for things you think they're important to realize they're not. And by the way, there's so much depression with the more successful an artist is, usually the more depressed they are for this very reason because for them they've been going i'll be happy when i've had i've got a number one single or whatever whatever their i'll be happy when dot 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 right there is so much depression anxiety with um highly successful artists entrepreneurs so many it happens all the time simply because we invest so much of our uh, self-worth into filling the voids right which we think we can we, if, if, you know we can put enough success in there that we'll feel better about ourselves and the truth is is that we don't right it comes from things like relationships and family and you know helping other people stuff like that but of course we don't realize that until we're a lot older so that's that's the thing i would change because um yeah i think i, I think i sullied my experience because not because of the music industry which can be a bit dodgy, but but honestly, just because of my uh, attitude towards the music industry. Can I ask a bit of a personal question? Hmm? What was your upbringing like? Uh, well, I, my upbringing was good. I mean, I had uh, I was lucky, you know, um, uh, middle class sort of upbringing. 
But my parents were highly religious. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, very, very religious people. Um, didn't have a lot of, they don't have a lot of emotional intelligence. They come from that kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? They yeah, just yeah. don't understand. Black thinking, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, exactly. You know, everything was swept under the carpet. It was yeah. always like, you know, putting on appearances. Nothing was ever discussed. So, you know, I mean, very, very common for, you know, Gen X, um, older millennials, um, to have had an experience like this because our parents' generation just didn't talk about their emotions. And basically, there's a lot of generational trauma. You know, you imagine my, my uh, I mean, my father was born in a Japanese prisoner war camp, or he wasn't born, but he was about six weeks old when he was there because my, my grandparents were missionaries in China when the Second World War kicked off. You can just imagine the amount of trauma. I mean, he doesn't remember anything, but you, you that okay. kind of trauma, yeah. uh, his parents' trauma, having, having spent four years in a Japanese prisoner war camp, none of that was dealt with. Right. Mm. Nobody went to therapy. Nobody. We didn't have podcasts. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. You know. We, yeah. we didn't have podcasts. We didn't have TikTok <laughs> where we could go and you know blah, 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 or you whatever. Just... We didn't have anything. Right. So 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 they didn't have any. Obviously, have any of that. So they just withheld all that, kept that trauma internalized, then passed it on to their kids, who passed it on to their kids. So our thing, met myself and Amy, who's my partner. Our thing is that we are cutting that chain now, right? So that our daughter, we're not passing on our trauma, but. That's part of, you know, the whole sort of creative, you know, journey is to sort of like uh, process all your trauma by through your creativity and helping other feel, people feel seen and heard so they know they're not alone or whatever, you know. Because I'm thinking, you know, like I'm kind of similar in, in, in the way you are. Um, so what was that word again? Multi? Well, the multi-potentialized. Yeah, multi-potentialized, yeah. you know, we have so many ideas. Yeah. Do you think that's partly of just how we are is there an impact of how we've been brought up or anything like that because i feel as if i think a lot of times when you kind of understand the reasons why you are the way you are it kind of helps to kind of accept it yeah Let's yeah no i agree uh, yeah i mean i think i think like anything i mean this this is beyond my my scope of understanding because okay, okay, yeah. I, I, you know um, uh, but i would i i mean for me in my own lived experience i would say it's part nurture part nature mm. um because you know again we were brought up in uh, an environment where it was about perfectionism right it's like oh you can't show any weakness outside everything has to be perfect you know the house is perfect the families are perfect uh, and this is you know because um in terms of my parents there's their self-worth was very much based on uh, what people in the church thought of them or what the minister thought of them and you know mm. they were they you know and you know that's not exclusive to them that's a very sort of common thing uh of our parents generation right so as a result of that everything you know perfectionism was drum was drilled into you as well right mm. and you know that but yeah i mean basically uh for, for me it's um neurodivergence we're born um and our, our brains are just wired differently yeah i think you're right because i think i've, I've always been quite um i've always had ideas you know i've always um executed on my ideas yeah. to be fair um i can't just sit down and so for example when i was growing up that's when like computers and and computer games were starting yeah. to come about and stuff and i remember like my mom brought me a pc and instead of me playing games i was learning how the games were made mm. instead of going on there used to be these chat rooms that everyone used to go on to i used to learn how the chat rooms were made mm. like so i've always been intrigued and kind of that's why i'm a bit of a tech guy like that and i feel as if a lot of people now even though they may have those interests but with social media and everything like that it has kind of pushed them in a direction where there is a lot more overthinking going on now there is a lot more depression anxiety sure. going on around now and i i feel as if it kind of because obviously we all know social media is a good tool but it can also be um, a bad tool as well. And I think if we kind of limit ourselves in that regard of kind of usage wise and everything, it will help. Um, but if there was any, what's the best piece of advice that you could share with our audience that kind of helped you to kind of, or maybe a summary of what your content is all about. And obviously um, I'll also link your content out down in below in the, in the description. But what would kind of be a few practical or the best advice that you've either received or that you give for our audience? With, with regards to getting unstuck? Yeah, with regards to getting unstuck and actually yeah. making moves. And yeah, that. so uh, in terms of creativity, always create for yourself. If you're creating for the audience, you're going to, if you're an overthinker, you're going to spend, I don't know, 
months trying to uh, second guess what the audience wants. It's impossible. Create stuff that you like and then find people that mm. agree with you. Uh, for getting unstuck, uh, everyone gets unstuck at the same reason. It's because you've got so many options in front of you. You're scared of picking the wrong one and wasting your time. But by not making a decision, you uh, create stress and anxiety, which creates your procrastination. You end up wasting your time anyway. So logically, you're, you're going to waste less time by, by experimenting on your options and just taking action. And basically, clarity comes from taking action, right? That is lame. It's cliche. I know. I know. I can, I can, I can feel people rolling their eyes right now going, oh, if only I'd known just to take action. But they don't take the action. It's really, that's it. But, but look, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's the obvious stuff, right? We overcomplicate everything. And then the reality is that we, because, because in our brains, we've got really complex problems. But really, they're very simple. The reason we're stuck is because we're not making any decisions. Make a fucking decision. It's easier said than done. I get that. But by realizing that every decision, nearly every decision is reversible, right? So if you go into, uh, let's say you've got four different marketing options, you go, okay, I'm going to spend two weeks doing this one, right? And then after two weeks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I like it and I'll move on to the next one. Then you know that it's a reversible decision, okay? Because it's not the fear um, of making the wrong decisions. It's, it's about coming to peace with decision making. Um, so th- that, is, that is it in a nutshell, basically. No, no, I think uh, that's wicked, man. This has been valuable for me, and I'm sure the audience is going to love it. Good. If people want to reach out to you, because I know you mentioned that you do one-to-one. Is it one-to-one coaching? Yeah, I do I do personal branding. I do one-to-one coaching. Um, uh, I've got courses. Uh, we're going to be doing an, uh, an app soon, so we're doing a SaaS product. Um, so, yeah, so there's all those kind of things. Okay, I, sorry, I forgot. I know you said that you, you do personal branding. Because I'm at a stage now, I know I've got the podcast, Minted Minds. Yeah. So does personal brand mean, as in Abdul's man, build that into a brand? Or what, what, does, what does personal branding mean? Yeah, it's, 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 it's so convoluted, right? <laughs> but I mean, basically, artist management is part of it is building a personal brand. You know, if you want to sell anything, whether it be albums, books, podcasts, you name it, anything in 2024, you need to have a personal brand. So for, it's different things for different people, right? For me, um, my personal brand is Jake Creative Hackers, right? So... Like most, many of my clients go, oh, should I, should I make it my name or should I make it my company name, right? I've had that. It's yeah, it's, before, it's yeah. a super common one. Changing our bio constantly. All these kind of things are really, really common, right? Because we, we struggle to define what it is we actually do because we're, we're overthinkers, right? Um, so for me, I just take my first name, Jake, and put Creative Hacker. So people know because um, it'd be really weird to respond to a message on TikTok going, hey, Creative Hackers. That's, yeah, that's just not yeah, going to happen, yeah. right? So you have to have your name in there at some point. So Jake and then Creative Hackers. So people instantly know that I'm a business, right? Which means that uh, uh, people tend to, out of nosiness, go and look at your profile, whether, mm. you, whether you have a call to action or not. But a personal brand is just, is just being known to solve a specific problem. Uh, in my view, right? So, uh, yeah, if, if you're if you're the biggest DJ in the world, um, then you know that you uh, I'm here to provide entertainment, and I I make trance music or I make techno music or whatever, right? So, but yeah, it's just about um, creating content so people, uh, yeah, get to know you and what you do. So in my case, I get people unstuck. I get creative people unstuck. That's what I do. So I've built a personal brand around that because I talk about it all the time. Uh, and as a result, people then come to me, go, oh, th- you know, this guy, uh, you know, they resonate with the content and then they come uh, and I help them, you know, whatever their creative projects are, really. No, oh, wicked, wicked. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to bring up? in the No, I think I'm good. But uh, yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. No, that was a, that was amazing. If people do want to reach out to you um, in case they've got any questions or anything like that or just want to check out your content, where's the best place to reach out? Yeah, I'm basically Jake Creative Hackers on TikTok. Um, it's the same on Substack. Um, yeah, or uh, jake at creativehackers.co. So yeah, that is my email address. But creativehackers.co um, is uh, my website. Wicked, perfect. Guys, um, that's uh, Jake. Jake, thank you again for um, Well, thank you for having me. It's been really good me. fun. Um, I'm, I'm sure people may have questions. So if you guys got any questions, you can either reach out to Jake directly or leave uh, comments in, uh, a com- uh, in the comments below. But uh, up until then, we'll see you on the next one. Peace. Peace. Cheese. No, I like that one. <laughs>